Hello there YouTube, it's been a while and we'll cover why that is and where I've been towards the end of the video. But first, we are something much more important to talk about and that's the fact that our research on this channel has been plagiarised by another YouTuber, Vangelina Scow, who, after being approached by me, seemingly tried to scare me off using the threat of lawyers. That's right, mere months after HBomberGuy released his bombshell of a video on this very topic, Someone who has dozens of videos covering Illuminati's death spiral thought it'd be a great idea to just rip myself and a bunch of other people off, only to then double down in the exact same way Illuminati did when caught in the act. Oh, it's gonna be one of those videos. But before we continue, a quick content warning for the following. Sexual assault, grooming, transmisia, misgendering, and injury. If you like our work and appreciate the research put into each video, please consider supporting the channel by Patreon. You can also support us by liking, commenting, and sharing this video on social media. I'd also just like to take the time to remind our viewers that the statements made throughout our videos are the opinions of myself, the host, based on the evidence I have available to me. They are not and should not be taken as unquestionable fact, which is why we reference everything because we're fallible. Thus we strive to give you, the viewer, the ability to check all evidence for yourself in order to make up your own mind, which is what the reference numbers in the top left corner are for, being numbers that match up with the reference list found in the transcript linked down below. As such, we encourage all viewers to do their own research to reach an informed conclusion about the topic. Hi there, my name is Ethel Thurston, she, her, they, them, and today we're going to be talking about the fact that Vangelina Scow ripped off literal years of hard work and presented said work as her own in her recent video, Lily Orchard, You Choose Biggest Creep. We'll also be discussing how she or her management firm, Solaro Management, tried to bluff me into backing down via escalating the matter to their lawyer, which, if you couldn't tell by the video, failed. Now there's a surprise. The work I'm talking about is, of course, our seven part series on Lily Orchard, more specifically the following five videos, each to varying degrees. Lily Orchard encouraged a friend to groom a minor. Lily Orchard grooms her audience with victim testimony. Lily Orchard sexed a 16 year old, second victim testimony, debunking Lily Orchard's pro-child predator arguments. And lastly, Lily Orchard's pro-child predator fanfic, Stockholm. The production for this series took a long time. Myself and Levi began working on the series in January of 2020. You see, in December of 2019, I'd given Lily Orchard a shout out in one of my videos, presenting her as a safe person due to the way she projects an unabashed hostility towards sexual predators very rarely seen, only for me to be approached by someone two days later about her history of Stockholm. Both myself and Levi began our own solo investigations, during which I removed the links to Lily's channel before reconvening a day or two later. Both of us had reached the same conclusion of, holy shit, there's even more. I immediately nuked the video, issued an apology, and got to work. I feel compelled to note that I nuked the video in spite of the fact that it was, and to this day remains, the one and only time I discussed being groomed as a 15 year old, along with how I was subsequently chased out of the furry fandom on YouTube after I blew the whistle on the 30 year old man who groomed me. That's actually what led me to create the channel Essence of Four, acting as a new start for myself. So it was an incredibly personal video, making it difficult to destroy, but we deemed it too dangerous to remain up. I also felt personally responsible to everyone that had seen the video before it was taken down, thus setting myself to alerting as many people to the danger as possible. We made a couple of posts before beginning work on what was, at the time, planned to be a single video. As for our investigation, researching, planning and writing the video turned out to be an absolute nightmare. There was just so much going on, so many little things that connected in so many little ways. That's why, whilst I knew I wanted to do the Incros video as a standalone piece, I didn't have any idea as to how we were going to do the rest. 
Figuring out that doing one video wasn't going to work for us because it didn't give these specific cases the time and attention they required is why the Ink Rose video came out in April of 2021, yet the next video, the one with Glaze testimony, that wouldn't come out until October of 2022. That's how much research and preparation was going into these videos. I remember just sitting there for weeks, going through snapshots of Lily Orchard's Tumblr, just hundreds and hundreds of pages, looking for new stuff or trying to find old stuff that no longer had its original source. And when I was done with Lily Orchard, I moved on to her friends. This, by the way, is how I became so acquainted with the URL workings of Film Fiction and Film Fetch, leading to the realization and subsequent breakthrough in the Stockholm video that I'm still really proud of to this day. This really was a, gentlemen, we've got her. There was also the stuff in the background that nobody thinks about, especially when it comes to topics like these. I remember back in 2020, 2021, Lily Orsha began talking about adopting. We scrambled like fighter pilots to try and figure out if there was anyone, anyone at all, we could reach out to to have Lily Orcher's name flash red to any adoption agency should she actually follow through. There was also the background care for Glade, who, again, was one of Lily's victims. I had to make sure that they felt supported by me whilst also ensuring that their testimony remained as unadulterated as possible. I didn't want to give anyone the chance to say that I had coached them, because that can be crushing for a victim. That's a hard tightrope to walk, let me tell you, especially when it comes to large issues like these. To give a specific example, I'm thoroughly anti-police, but was fully prepared to stand by Glade if he wanted to involve them, because the victim's autonomy is paramount. So there was a lot going on that you didn't see. Now, the reason I'm going on about all the work that went into the series is to try and help you understand why plagiarism feels, in many ways, so violating. It's not like I snap my fingers three times, the stars aligned, video arises from the bosom of my brain. There's a lot of work that goes into what I do. So to spend literal years of your life on a single project, only to have someone come along and present said work as their own, monetizing your hard work four different ways, it really is depressing. I get that I might not seem the most impacted in this video, I'm probably cracking a few more jokes than usual, but that's not because it isn't bad, it's because I'm used to tackling people who want me dead because I'm trans. So this, this is still an improvement, but better than genocide, isn't what I consider high praise. Suffice to say, when I discovered I'd been plagiarized, it did impact me, causing me to spiral. I burnt myself out at the end of last year, covering my personal trauma, only to need emergency dental work as I began feeling better, only to then break my foot. I haven't been able to find a suitable time to record anything I've been writing. As a result, I've been mentally punishing myself for not getting anything out. So to have someone come along and rip myself and Levi off? It fucking bricked me. It really did. I remember having to calm myself down before I approached Scout about the issue, hoping we could resolve things peacefully. Now, sadly, Scout didn't share my desire to have her fix things, and we'll get to exactly how she burnt me. But first, Let's establish how I know, for a fact, that Scout stripped my my series to make her own video. Starting with the hard data, the first thing I did when I realized I was being plagiarized was download Scout's video and begin cutting it up into sections. What I found was that a 30 minute section of her 38 minute video, starting from 2032, was ripped directly from mine, as shown in the clips raised into the second higher track. Though, to clarify one thing, when I went through it again, I did find two clips amounting to just over 1 minute 2 seconds that were her own original content. One being a 20 second remark about a book she read as a child, and another 40 second remark about Lily's writing tips, which, aside from as an introductory tool to the Inkrose video, I had absolutely no interest in covering. I'll still refer to it as the 30 minute section, 
just know that I'm only claiming 12 minutes of it. Now, throughout that 13 minute section, Scal presents eight screenshots, eight pieces of visual evidence, which she then spends the remaining time talking about. And it's those eight screenshots that allow me to confirm, without a shadow of a doubt, that they were ripped directly from my video. How? Well, I'm glad you asked. I will be using three data points to confirm that these screenshots were ripped directly from our video. The first and perhaps weakest data point is zoom factor and layout. That is to say, not all of the images I took were taken at the same level as zoom, and when you zoom in and out on a page on Tumblr or Twitter, it doesn't merely pan in like a camera lens, every now and then it shifts things around. Take this example I grabbed whilst writing the script, taken from Stockholm Uberfan, The Last Alicorn. Here is the page at 100%, here is that same page at 175%, and here it is again at 200%. Notice how the layout of the page keeps changing. Therefore, if the layout of these eight screenshots matches those seen in mine, that is conducive to the images having been ripped directly from our video, since if any of them didn't match, that'd throw the whole thing off. Though again, this is perhaps the weakest piece of data on its own. The second data point, or perhaps points, are the backgrounds and profile pics being used in any given screenshot. Lily Orchard has periodically updated both her background and her profile pic dozens of times over the last couple of years. That means, if the background and profile pics throughout the screenshots match those seen in mine, that is further proof that the images have been ripped directly from our video. The third and final data point is a security feature personalized to me. As I'm sure you're aware by now, I am trans, and there is a safety tool out there, in use by trans people, that changes the usernames and links of users on certain sites based on whether they've been voted safe or dangerous to trans people. Do note it is a deeply flawed app, not everyone green is in fact safe, as we'll see in a second, but it is handy to weed out the reds. Now, I say it's deeply flawed in who it marks green, because, you guessed it, Lily Orchard is marked green by default, meaning that enough people have voted her safe to trans people at one point in time to earn a green rating. What's particularly interesting about this data point, however, is the fact that when I first began gathering evidence, I didn't think to manually mark Lily Orchard as unsafe, but that changed halfway through. After all, she did groom trans minors. Yet I only made the switch in the midst of gathering evidence, meaning certain images have Lily Orchard's name and other periphery details in green, whilst other images show her name in red. This means that, in order for scale screenshots to have the same colour as mine, she'd have had to, through some cosmic coincidence, install the same app, which is visibly absent from screenshots used earlier in her video, and change it at the very same time I did, whilst gathering the evidence in the exact same order as me. Suffice to say, this data point is more than enough on its own, but I wanted to include the other two to really nail this. If I get a perfect match along all three points, that is as close to proof of non-verbatim plagiarism as you can really get, aside from a written confession, of course. So let's start with the first image that appears in Scal's video at 2216, taken from our Inkrose video as seen at 144. Let's overlay that using 50% transparency to reveal that yes, it's a one-to-one -one match on the zoom factor. Moving on next to the profile pic, since the background is not visible, we see Lily is sporting the exact same smug face on a purple background in both images. Lastly, looking at Lily Orchard's username, we see that it is highlighted in green in both images, making this a perfect match. Moving on to the second image, which appears in Scal's video at 2536, this one was copied from our video containing Glaze testimony, as seen at 1635. Let's overlay that, revealing again, a one-to-one -one match on the zoom factor. Moving on to the background and profile pic, we see Lily is in her purple phase, and she is using the same image of her avatar on a light background, staring to one side. Lastly, looking at the post date and number of notes, whilst not legible in Scal's copy, we can just about make out the red colouring, just like in the original, signalling that this was taken after I manually updated Lily's name on my end, 
once again making this a perfect match. The third image, which appears in Scal's video at 2339, was again copied from our video containing Glaze testimony as seen at 1756. Let's overlay that, revealing again a one-to-one -one match on the zoom factor. Moving on to the background and profile pic, we see Lily was still in her paper phase so far as the background. Lastly, looking at the post date, account name, note this is Lily's art profile, and number of notes, we see that this was taken before I manually updated Lily's name on my end, making this another perfect match. The fourth image, which appears in Scar's video at 2629, was, again, copied from our video containing Glaze's testimony, as seen at 2255. However, it was also shown again in the video containing Mackenzie's testimony, including at 3029, a fact that will be important when we take a look at how even the stuff said between the screenshots that Scal personally presents as her own original thoughts were copied directly from the personal thoughts of both myself and Levi regarding this very same piece of evidence. So I just wanted to note that quickly. Let's overlay that, revealing again a one-to-one -one match on the zoom factor. Moving on to the background and profile pic, we see Lily in her purple phase, and she is using the same image of her avatar on a light background, staring to one side. We also see the number of notes in this one on Scal's copy is just about legible at one note, same as my own screenshot. Lastly, looking at the post date, number of notes, and Lily's name, whilst difficult to read on Scal's copy, we can clearly make out the red colouring, especially around Lily's name, just like in the original, signalling that this was taken after I manually updated Lily's name on my end, once again, making this a perfect match. The fifth image, which appears in Scal's video at 2815, was copied from my video debunking Lily Orchard's child predator arguments, as seen at 216. Let's overlay that, revealing again a one-to-one -one match on the zoom factor. Moving on to the background and profile pics, we not only see Lily in her purple phase, but this time has her bisexual profile pic, as seen at the bottom of the notes. Speaking of notes, there are six other notes visible in Scal's copy, all of them containing the exact same profile pic and username, as seen in my original, whilst also appearing in the exact same order. Lastly, looking at the post date, number of notes, and Lily's name, whilst difficult to read in Scal's copy, we can clearly make out the red colouring, especially around Lily's name, just like in the original, again, signalling that this was taken after I manually updated Lily's name on my end, once again, making this a perfect match. The sixth image, which appears in Scal's video at 2818, was taken from the same video as before, as seen at 222. Let's overlay that, revealing again a one-to-one -one match on the zoom factor. Moving on to the background and profile pics, whilst we can't see Lily's profile pic in this image, what we can see are the purple background along with six individuals in the notes, all sporting the exact same profile pictures as the ones in my original image, all in the exact same order. Lastly, looking at the post date and number of notes, whilst difficult to read in Scout's copy, we can still make out the red colouring, just like in the original, Again, signalling that this was taken after I manually updated Lily's name on my end, once again, making this a perfect match. The seventh image, which appears in Scal's video at 2842, was taken from the same video as before, as seen at 1908. Let's overlay that, revealing again a one-to-one -one match on the zoom factor. Moving on to the background and profile pics, of course, this is Twitter, yet we do see the same profile pic in both Scal's copy and my original. Lastly, looking at Lily's username and tag, we can clearly make out the red colouring, just like the original, signalling that this was taken after I manually updated Lily's name on my end, once again making this a perfect match. Bringing us to the eighth and final image, which appears in Scal's video at 3317, and was taken from our Stockholm video as seen at 1605. Let's overlay that, revealing, surprise surprise, a one-to-one -one match on the zoom factor. Moving on to profile pics, we see Lily has her bisexual avatar. Lastly, looking at Lily's username, we can clearly make out the red colouring, just like the original, signalling for one final time that this was taken after I manually updated Lily's name on my end, once again, making this a perfect match. So that's 8 for 8, 
perfect matches on all images along these three data points, including one which was personally tailored to my own preferences. That is confirmation that these images were ripped directly from my video. Another data point that the keen-eyed amongst you might have noticed is that every single image, and indeed the very layout of this 13-minute section, follows the exact same order as our series. I was in a lot of distress when I first realised we'd been plagiarised, so Levi jumped in to grab the timestamps in Scal's video along with my originals, once again proving that he is the best bird a girl could ask for. And he was the one who noticed that he didn't have to jump between videos to do so. Scal had not only ripped the evidence straight from our videos without crediting, she didn't even bother to change their order, instead going through the evidence exactly as we did. Which is interesting, considering we didn't work through said evidence in chronological order, as evidence in how the safety feature in the screenshots jumped from green to red to green again. Yet Scow would like you, along with her audience and patrons, to think that she came up with all of this on her own. That it's just a coincidence that the screenshots are identical to mine on several distinct data points, including a personalised safety feature and the order in which they are discussed. I think the technical term used to describe such a phenomenon in statistics is absolute fucking bollocks. Scow is not only taking me for a fool, but her own audience as such in how she genuinely thinks that she can get away with this. So, if you're a fan of hers, especially if you're someone who donates to her Patreon, are you going to prove her right? Or are you going to have some damn self-respect? Another thing that irks me about this is just how lazy the strip mining was. One thing you might have noticed is that Scow screenshots are completely out of focus, with the secondary text on many of them being illegible. Yet, my own copies of my screenshots aren't, in spite of those screenshots having been grabbed from the very same rendered video. I didn't go back to the editing file, as that would be more hassle than it's worth. The reason my own copies are so much better is because I use an in-program snapshot feature. With Scow, I am almost certain that she didn't even bother to download my videos and take what she wanted that way. I think she just took screenshots whilst watching our videos before trimming them down. That's how little respect she has for the work she stole. Another example of her laziness can be seen in the fact that I literally reference everything I can, passing most of it through the internet archive, meaning that had she wanted to, she could have opened them herself and taken the screenshot at whatever zoom level she liked without the security feature, and it would have made proving her plagiarism difficult, if not impossible. But she didn't, because the entire point of plagiarism is to avoid doing the work by stealing from others. It reveals a great disdain towards everything Scow presents to her own audience as her original work worthy of their money. What Scow has done here, as proven thus far, is effectively go into a research paper ripping out all the data tables along with the graphs, charts, and diagrams before presenting them as her own in a paper she has written, whilst expecting to be paid for it, not just in AdSense and Patreon, but also through our sponsor, HelloFresh, not to mention merchandise. That alone is plagiarism, is fraud, is theft. But it gets even worse when we actually take a look at the stuff she says between the evidence. Because we find out that she's stolen more than just the evidence provided throughout our series, she's attempted to claim mine and Levi's personal thoughts as her own. Starting with what is perhaps the clearest example of this, the same moment that hit me like a brick. Namely, this little nugget taken from just after Scal shares the screenshot in which Lily presents herself as a safe way for young people to explore their sexuality by sending her news. But the first thing that popped into my brain was what if she just asked herself this question so that she could answer it and get people to send her these photos of themselves? And how is she going to vet that the people who are sending them are adults? Oh, it just popped into your head? Really? You had that thought? 
So it has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that in our video containing Mackenzie's testimony, I quite literally say the following. Now, I don't know if these messages are sent in by a particularly fervent Lily Orchard fan, or if she's sending these herself, within minutes of providing the exact same piece of evidence. Like, yeah, I go into greater detail about a couple more pieces since I was covering a broader point, but like, you can see me discussing the evidence and the bit I just played you on the same page in my script. They're not exactly disconnected points. As for the idea that she thought of this from a single screenshot, is it actually reasonable to come up with that if you have no prior knowledge about Lily Orchard and how she runs her community? I'd argue not. Like, there's a reason I presented a bunch of evidence showing how, anytime there's a controversy surrounding Lily, she always gets sent softball questions anonymously which allow her to reframe the issue however she pleases. No one would believe it if it wasn't a pattern. So the comment was made in a very specific context, leading it to come out of left field without it. Add that to the fact that, as demonstrated earlier, Scow or someone on Scow's team almost certainly watched our videos to strip mine them for screenshots, and I would argue that this is very strong evidence of her not only stealing our hard work, but our very thoughts, presenting them as her own original ideas. Like, she explicitly states that this popped into her brain, rather than she heard it from someone else and it stuck with her. This was the moment I knew I was going to have to act. I even make the same point as her second question, the one asking... And how is she going to vet that the people who are sending them are adults? This one comes from the Glade video in which I said the following... Lily has confessed that people in her audience regularly send her naked photos of themselves. And while she claims to delete them all, there's no fucking way to check that. This is the same person who went out of her way to violate the security of the Safe for Work section she set up on her server. How can we be sure she doesn't keep them? And how the living fuck can we be certain that none of the minors she has groomed have fallen victim to this? Yet the shit show continues. For whilst I reached the following conclusion in my own video on Stockholm, said narrative is carried over into chapter 23, post-traumatic stress disorder. Twilight's abuse is given a pardon by a professional because it's apparently what essentially has come to expect from life and she should therefore keep indulging in it. Sweetie Belle is further punished for the actions of a child predator and the fanfic ends with a very ham-fisted letter by Twilight to Princess Celestia Closing with, I've learned, I think we all have, that to truly be with someone, you have to take the good with the bad. Don't be a fair weather friend, take the one you love at their best and worst, or not at all. Your former student, Twilight Sparkle. Now, if you've watched the MLP series, you know that Twilight's letters are the summary of whichever moral lesson has been learnt throughout the episode. Considering this, alongside Shy's own feelings in the previous chapter, and the overall message of Lee's fanfic is laid out quite literally in black and white. To report someone who has sexually assaulted a minor makes you a fair-weather friend. That is Lee's main moral lesson to the reader, that you should enable someone who abuses children. That gets taken, reheated, and slopped onto a plate as... And one character in this essays a minor. One of the friends in the story reports the person who does that. And for some reason, the whole lesson of the story is that this makes the person who did the reporting a bad friend. I especially love how she changed fair weather friend, like in the actual letter, to bad friend. It's very, can I copy your homework? Sure, just change a few words. Except... You know, I was not asked in any way. Scow just straight up stole my analysis and presented it as her own. We also see something similar in her editing of the video in which Lily admitted to writing Stockholm. For whilst I repeated that specific sentence... When I started this series, I had every intention on doing something special for Halloween, and nothing could be better than taking a truly bizarre and messed up fanfic and picking through it like an amphetamine-fueled chimp. But which one? There's so many. 
Fall out Equestria? That's too long. Fall of Equestria? F no. Equestrian Pony Meat Business? I think I'll break my rating limits. I can't do Stockholm, I wrote that one. But then I thought, what about that one, Jerry? The one that started this whole trend of grimdark fanfiction. Can't do Stockholm, I wrote that one. Can't do Stockholm, I wrote that one. Can't do Stockholm, I wrote that one. Scow goes ahead and slows it down. Fall out Equestria? That's too long. Fall of Equestria? No. Equestrian Pony Meat Business? I think I'll break my rating limits. Can't do Stockholm, I wrote that one. Now, to be fair, this particular piece of evidence is weak on its own. It's not exactly a hard thing to come up with. But when taken in the entire context of how everything else was copied, it does hint to a fundamental lack of imagination. Though Scow was at least smart enough to download a clean copy of the video from somewhere else, as the timecode isn't present in her video, the one visible now having been added to show where the offending clip is in her video. Returning to something a little stronger, Here's my comment about the way in which Lily has avoided having her YouTube channel closed down for running sexual streams. Even YouTube's terms of service state very clearly that explicit content meant to be sexually gratifying is not allowed on YouTube, which is further expanded upon to include nudity or partial nudity that's meant for sexual gratification. And yet, in spite of banning all sexually gratifying content, YouTube still has an 18 plus category something that would not exist if 18 plus were synonymous with sexually gratifying content, like Lily is pretending. And Lily knows this, that's why she deletes her streams to ensure that they're never flagged for said sexual content. Which Scow reduces down to... She also apparently did this a lot on YouTube live streams and would get away with it by deleting the stream immediately after, which is just completely against YouTube's terms of service. This shit just keeps on happening throughout the entire 30 minute section, minus the one minute discussed at the start. That is the entire fucking section, ripped straight from our series. And whilst I get that it's more or less a footnotes edition, the thing about footnotes is that they don't compete with the original and they certainly don't fucking pretend like they're not based on the original. Returning to my researcher paper analogy, this is beyond simply strip mining a paper for its data and grass. This is like reading the paper, strip mining it, and then attempting to rewrite what was originally written from memory, adding virtually no original thought. And the laziness fucking shows. At one point in her video, Scow acknowledges that Lily Orchard lied about age verification on YouTube. She also lied and said that YouTube requires somebody to submit their ID in order to watch 18 plus streams, which is not true. Like, that's just not true. And she would also know that that's not true. And anybody who's ever watched any kind of age-restricted content on YouTube would also know that that's not true. So I don't know how you make such a blatant lie and just expect everybody to take that at face value. But this seems to be a thing that controversial creators do. I don't get it. I'm never going to get it. Doesn't make any sense. Yet she fails to note the specifics of how Lily lied, leading Scal to present misinformation giving Lily Orchard ammunition to discredit not just Scow, but all her critics. For an actual explanation of the lie, we can return to my original breakdown of Lily's claim. Only problem is, this is false, at least in the way it has been presented here. You see, whilst YouTube has introduced ID verification in certain territories, the key phrase here is certain territories namely Australia, the European Union, the European Economic Area, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. As you will notice, neither Canada, the place Lily is from, nor the US, the place where the majority of Lily's audience exists, are included on that list. So Lily is misinforming her audience, mine is included, as a means of hiding her predatory behaviour. But wait, didn't Scow imply that she was falling back on her own personal experience as someone within the EU? Yeah, she did. For a channel that was created in 2012, meaning it was old enough to grandfather into the 18 plus category when the laws were first introduced. I know because this channel, created in 2011, was the same. 
Yet the moment I set up my personal channel using a completely different email, selecting the UK as my country of origin, Google did require me to supply my ID. So, returning to the misinformation, Scal doesn't even do us the decency of going back to double check the specific context of her assertions, she just makes the most generic statement possible, and that's it. Which is not only dangerous in how it gives Lee Orchard ammunition, it's also fucking insulting. As with all plagiarism, it's insulting to me and Levi as artists, but more important than that, it's insulting to Levi specifically as someone whose experience as another victim of Lily Orchard was instrumental to many of the context-specific insights we had, with Levi having quite literally coined the phrase, Lily Orchard's mind prison, to describe the atmosphere of control and manipulation, like discussed regarding the whole anonymous question thing. Insight, I must add, that was also based on over 24 years of personal suffering at the hands of other abusers. All of that was just stripped away for a cheap cash grab. It's also insulting to the topic in general, along with all of us who have ever been made to suffer through similar violence. As someone who was raped as a child and later groomed online, I am personally disgusted by just how half our Scouse coverage of the topic is. Her commentary on the issue is worse than worthless. It is actively harmful. The reason Lily Orchard gets away with so much shit is because hacks like Scowl present misinformation as fact, making more work for people like me by kicking up dust, making a mess of things, allowing Lily Orchard to slip away amongst the chaos. This is why it took us years to compile everything, to avoid the very thing that Scowl, in her unending laziness, has gone on to do. Well, Scowl, You've muddied the field and made it easier for a sexual predator to hand wave her critics. I hope you're fucking proud of yourself. Speaking of harm, another way I know for a fact that Scow has watched our videos is by her giving specifics regarding Glaze's testimony. She also encouraged a minor to watch her stream to find out what happens in it, and in that stream, she showed parts of herself that are not suitable for everybody of every age group and for every website, if you get what I mean. Now, to be fair, when I first came across Scow's video, a whole 4 days and 50,000 views after publishing, she did have a single line in her description which read as quote, Thank you to lilyorchardgossipblog.tumblr.com for having a lot of resources and screenshots in one place, end quote. Don't you worry, we will get to how she edited her description AFTER I sent her an email in the next chapter. Yet, returning to things BEFORE then, it is POSSIBLE that she got her information from there. I know she didn't get the screenshots from them, since said blog doesn't use mine. Anything I added, they were smart enough to use the links I provided to take their own. But Levi, wanting to be thorough, went through the blog and searched for anything relating to Glade, or even an unnamed minor, finding a single, passing mention of Glade in the following. Quote, Clarification, she banned minors from her server because the walls were closing in. Between the porn accounts full of CSEM, her history of writing CSEM, her soliciting sexual encounters via her YouTube streams, and her baiting a minor into clicking on an 18 plus stream, this is just her covering her ass. End quote. As you can see, no specific details as to what Lily actually did in the stream she baited Glade to watch, just that it was 18 plus. So, considering that fact, along with everything else I've shown you thus far, I can only conclude, personally, that she watched the video with Glade's testimony, explaining not just how she got the screenshots, but also how she knows about the specifics. But perhaps more important than the plagiarism, Scow is dehumanising Glade, Lily Orchard's victim, in this instance. By refusing to give Glade a name or reference his actual testimony, Scow is effectively stripping him of his humanity and voice. Glade is no longer a person who has shared their testimony in Scow's video, but a nameless case, a file, an object to be passed around. That's it. 
That's how she treats the victims of the person she's pretending to expose. Scow is just exploiting Glade in a different way to Lily Orchard, but that doesn't make it right. Yet, to add insult to injury, Scow has the fucking ghoul to say the following. These are very, very serious accusations. Obviously, it's very, very important to listen to the people who say these things have happened to them. Oh? You think it's important to listen to Lily Orchard's victims? Well, how the fuck are people meant to do just that when you quite literally refuse to name or source them? Tell me how the fuck they can listen. Though it's not just Glade. Lily Orchard's other victims receive the exact same treatment. Because, in spite of quite literally saying the following whilst reading out Courtney's testimony, repeatedly... I will, however, link the full post in the description if you want to read the full thing. Again, if you feel like you can handle it, then you can read the full thing. It's in my description. This was not the case. Again, the only line that even mentioned anyone else was the one that read, Thank you to lilyorchardgossipblog.tumblr.com for having a lot of resources and screenshots in one place. And that is it. Scow couldn't even be bothered to reference the people she said she linked, let alone all of the people whose work she stole. At least she didn't until I sent her an email, which we'll cover in more detail in a minute. But returning to what she did the very next day, in spite of her refusing to respond to me, Scow suddenly updated her description. Not only did she now include a link to the aforementioned blog, but a random video by Definitely Bored Oranges, Josh Scorcher's response to Lily Orchard, yes, THE Josh Scorcher who went on to date Inkros after he and Lily groomed her as a minor, Lizzie's testimony, a copy of Courtney's testimony, notably the copy behind a paywall, put up by someone who was outed as having sexually harassed Courtney as opposed to, you know, one of the openly mirrored copies, and a single post by Tumblr user Opinionated User. None of which contain the screenshots I've shown you, by the way. What I don't think Scow realises is that, by including this list almost a week after her video had been published, after it had already amassed 50,000 views, she was tacitly admitting that she had plagiarised many of these people. All of these sources should have been there on day one. And even then, that's not enough. She still needs to give some sort of signal when she's referencing them, either verbally or visually, like our numerical referencing. Because it is downright shocking to see the similarities between Scow's actions here and Illuminati, aka Blair, as called out in H. Bomber Guy's plagiarism video last year. But here's where it gets interesting. Blair knows people might notice this, so she's come up with a defence mechanism. The video has a link in the description to a list of sources, where stuff she quoted or showed in the video gets linked. This is normal, lots of people do this, although usually they cite them when they use them in the actual video, but still. It's an unlabeled collection of links that's difficult to sort through, but if you keep digging, eventually you find a link to Brian Deere's YouTube upload of the documentary. So now if anyone criticises the fact she ripped it off, she can say, no, I I was using a source, I cited it, check, it's in my list! Somewhere! And she uses this flimsy excuse to basically steal anything she wants. Blair frequently plagiarises people, never mentions they exist in the video or cites them anywhere, but she puts a link in a list no one will read. So that makes it okay, right? Alice Illuminati had the decency to source her victims from day one. Scow only does so after she's been called out. And even then, she deliberately left me out of updated description, in spite of the fact that I can show substantial evidence of just how much she had plagiarised us during this specific 30 minute segment. It's because of this that I predict that, with the publishing of this video, Scow and her followers are probably going to try and argue that her source list was there from day one, and that all the screenshots and all the information stolen from us actually came from these other people, banking on an audience just trusting her. You know, exactly what Leorcia did when she lied about ID verification on YouTube. However, there is one more aspect to all this I'd like to discuss. Evidence that very strongly spells out to me personally that this was not an accident or genuine mistake. 
and that's Scar's response to my attempts to reach out to her. As already noted, I was livid when I realised just how bad the plagiarism was, needing to calm down before I could do anything else. Though, once I had, I decided to try and reach out to Evangelina Scow for a number of reasons. One, I was hoping that there might be something I just missed, I'm not sure what, but something, anything, that might have explained things other than this person ripped off years of my work. It was also possible that Scow didn't write or research her own content merely presenting it, meaning it might not be her who was responsible for the plagiarism. I didn't want to attack her as a person until I had a better idea of whether this was deliberate on her part or not. Third, I just wanted to give people a chance to own up to it to pay the compensation I felt I was owed for the damages at this point before moving on. So here's what I wrote. Quote, Hi, I'm reaching out to you because I've learned that your channel has plagiarised several of my videos. Your channel's video, Lily Orchard, YouTube's biggest creep, Lily Pete, contains several screenshots which are identical to the ones from my videos, the presenter copies several of my phrases almost word for word, and the presenter references the source of our victim testimony, who has not shared their story anywhere else. Plagiarism is not only morally wrong, but also a violation of copyright law, so I expect this to be corrected. Essence of Thought has always intended for our resources to be freely used by others, so usually we would only require you to link our channel in the video description, credit us for the screenshots, and have the presenter cite us whenever one of our ideas or pieces of evidence is used in the video. Since you, your writers or your researchers, did not do so, we feel we are entitled to 30% of the video's monetary value as compensation based on the fact that 30 minutes of a 38 minute video are clearly plagiarised. That includes AdSense, Patreon earnings for the month of February, and sponsorship earnings from HelloFresh. These actions are to be taken along with issuing a correction slash apology to all social media, as well as including an explanation of the issue at the top of the video description, run by us first, explaining the error. Thank you for your time, Ethel Thurston, founder of Essence of Fort. End quote. That was sent on Tuesday the 20th of February 2024. There are a couple of corrections I'd like to make regarding this letter, the first being about the 30 minute estimate. Again, going back, I trimmed out the 1 minute of filler, making it 12 minutes as opposed to 13. That said, Scout also spends 1 minute on her intro and 2 on her outro, which aren't really content, meaning it's 12 minutes out of 34 minutes as opposed to 13 minutes out of 38 minutes. So accounting for that, the plagiarised material is still about a third of the research portion of the video, which I would argue is very much the portion being monetized. No offence to Scow, but people aren't turning up for her intro and outro. The second correction relates to the sentence, the presenter copies several of my phrases almost word for word, which is a bit strong. Again, when I wrote this, I was coming down from an anxiety spike, passing stuff between myself and Levi. I've shown you the evidence regarding the comment about Lily sending herself anonymous questions and the concluding narrative of Stockholm. That's what this was referenced to. But I do admit, word for word, is too strong of a characterization. I just need to make that absolutely clear, keeping in mind that this is the first and thus far only time I share these emails publicly, hence the immediate need to add this addendum. That said, I'm still pretty happy with this in general. I felt it's a good balance between being open to having the situation explained to me, yet also firm in that I'm not going to be pushed around. I think 30% of the video's monetary value is a fair asking price, considering the extent and nature of the plagiarism, whilst also noting that, had I been properly cited in the video, I wouldn't have taken such an issue. I also hope that me approaching them might cause Scow or anyone working behind the screen to reevaluate how they do things. The cynic in me, however, went ahead and archived a copy of her video on Internet Archive, not for the video itself, but for the description, just in case she tried to sneak the references in to pretend like they were always there. And wouldn't you know it, that's exactly what she did. About midway through the 21st, I checked back in to find the updated description sourcing various people, minus myself. This to me was an immediate red flag. That she knew to source these people the moment I questioned her suggests very strongly that whoever is running things is fully cognizant of what they are doing. That's to say, Scow or Scow's team know they're plagiarising, 
They're just relying on nobody being willing to take on a channel of her size. I say that because this screen's preparing to go on the defense. I imagine that, when this video goes out, Scow and her supporters will pretend like the description always included these new sources, or that she forgot to include them, something she could have said in response to my initial email. If you think there's a simple explanation, it's natural to try and share that explanation. Yet, she can't really do that now, since it ignores the fact that she STILL hasn't referenced me for the work she stole from our channel. To me personally, these are not the actions of an honest person owning up to a mistake or a flaw in the system, these are the actions of a dishonest person trying to get away with plagiarism. That said, I'm always told to give people the benefit of the doubt, to give them more chances to fix their mistakes, so I reached out again, this time stating that quote, Hi. I'm aware that you have updated your video description since my email to include everyone you plagiarized, excluding me, in spite of the fact that I can prove you ripped 12 minutes of your video from my series, including through the clever application of data triangulation. I am, suffice to say, disappointed with your course of action and would like to give you one final chance to make amends before I go public with everything. Ethel Thurston, founder of Essence of Thought. End quote. This was sent on Wednesday, the 21st of February, 2024. I would finally receive a response on Thursday the 22nd, stating, quote, Thank you for following up. All further correspondence can be sent to our lawyer, end quote. She then gave me the email address of a lawyer in Canada. Now, I'm not gonna lie, this threw me for a bit, as Scow either lives in Dublin or Macedonia, at least according to her Twitter and WikiTube profile. Then, my wife Adita, who is also a lawyer, pointed out the custom email Scow users, at Solaro MGMT, with Solaro Management being a Canadian-based media management company. Now, I'm not particularly worried about this, since I've seen how lawyers typically operate in these sorts of situations, though to be clear, I'm not a legal professional myself. But, as I've seen it, as a human rights activist who has made some pretty fragile enemies over the years, the whole talk to my lawyer is only something you really say in person. When it comes to writing, you go to your lawyer and have them respond for you. The fact that they haven't done so suggests to me that they likely haven't taken the case you said lawyer, at least not yet, and are hoping that the mere mention of a lawyer will scare me into self-censoring. And yes, I do consider that to be threatening behaviour. I approached Scow in the hopes that she would be open to talking to me as a human being, hopefully explaining what happened, and, if no good explanation could be given for her actions, apologising before going on to make amends. I think it's a very human reaction to want to explain ourselves when we're made aware of the fact that we're hurting other people, even if we weren't previously aware that we were doing so, and that's what I was hoping for. So for Scow to jump straight to telling me to contact her lawyer, Reads to me like someone going, Oh, you wanna have a go then? Just on a legal level, effectively pressuring me to stop pursuing the matter. Another thing I find really interesting about this entire situation is that Scout literally published a video last month about how Illuminati is gearing up to sue various people who have come forward and shared their horrible experiences of how she abused and exploited them, including via plagiarism. Yet, here Scow is, refusing to even try and engage in civil conversation after she was caught plagiarising. So when she says shit like this... I don't know how you make such a blatant lie and just expect everybody to take that at face value, but this seems to be a thing that controversial creators do. I don't get it. I'm never gonna get it. Doesn't make any sense. I don't believe her. She is exactly the same as a lot of the people she criticises, she is just another Illuminati. And if you're a fan of hers, especially if you're someone giving to her Patreon, I have to ask, do you like being played for a sucker? Because that's what she's doing. She not only ripped myself, Levi, and our patrons off by plagiarizing our work, but she's also ripped you off in presenting other people's work, lazily blended as her own. And it's not just her viewers and patrons, it's also her corporate sponsors. These people pay, either with their money or time, 
as with the case with ads, to see or appear in original content. They do not pay to see or appear in plagiarized crap. So yeah, that's the situation so far. Minus one very shocking update, but I'll save that for a standalone piece. If you see my post, you know what it is. But returning to the reply, that's why I've now gone ahead and published this video, hopefully exposing Vangelina Scow and Solaro Management for what they are, at least in light of the evidence I have available to me. But again, do check and double check the evidence for yourself. Maybe you'll notice something I missed and I'll be forced to swallow humble pie. But that's gonna have to be some pretty amazing evidence at this point. Something else I want to comment on, but couldn't figure out where to slot it, is the transmissia in Scow's comment section. When I sent her the email, I stopped by, leaving her a standalone comment and a reply to her pinned post, letting her know about the email. And when I returned to see if the comment was still up, I was shocked by just how much anti-trans rhetoric there was in the comment section. So I went through, collecting a bunch of these comments, up to 24 of them, before just giving up. I couldn't continue because of how depressing it was as a trans person. Here is the wall of bigotry I created. Note that I included my own comment to show just how many of these comments were posted in the three days after my own post. So let's start with a general point. If you cannot create a community in which marginalized people are largely safe, you have absolutely no business doing so. As a creator, it is 100% your responsibility to moderate your space, and I say that as someone whose videos on Lily Orchard have garnered more than a million views collectively. Go through the comment section on my videos, you will not find a single transmisic or ableist remark, or indeed any form of bigotry. I mention ableism specifically since it's very often connected to transmisia, as seen in the comments stating that Lily is an autistic dude. When you dead name and misgender someone, even a terrible person, I can guarantee that they absolutely do not care, but that other trans people checking out the comments will be affected. Being more specific to Scal's video, however, Glade and Courtney, that's Lily's sister, are trans. That's at least two of the victims referenced in Scal's video who would not be safe scrolling through the comment section of her video. If you cannot guarantee that the people you are referencing will be safe in the space immediately surrounding your video, you have no business referencing them. That's exploitation. You're taking from them without even ensuring that they be safe in your community. That is just a horrific state of affairs, though I wish I could say I was shocked. So that's the case, meaning all that's left to talk about is the impact the entire thing has had on me whilst also explaining where I've been the last month and a half. Because as much as I joke and try to laugh things off, this really couldn't have come at a worse time for me. For those on my channel, you probably noticed that I haven't uploaded a single video since December 2023. Now, the reason for this, at least to begin with, is because I was burnt out from just how personally traumatic my last video was. And like, okay, we get it. I took a couple of weeks off after producing a three hour, fully referenced, fully subtitled video. That's not that unusual. However, just as I was getting ready to get back into recording, one of my old NHS fillings failed, opening things up to a rather severe infection, leading me to require some emergency dentistry, before the problem reached the jaw. I was in and out of the dentist over a period of about a month, just trying to get rid of the infection, as it was shockingly bad. And then, just as I was waiting to have the final root canal session before being capped, I had an accident which broke my foot. Note that I will be showing you all the slides for my CT scan in a bit, so if you don't want to see it, look away. I'll let you know when it's safe to look back. Just give you a couple of seconds. I have a commutative fracture at the base of the first metal tarsal on my right foot. That's the socket joint shown here. Now, the first doctor I saw said that I'm going to need midfoot fusion surgery as soon as possible. 
However, I got a second opinion today, along with a third and fourth for free, and they reached a different conclusion. They're putting me on an observation period whilst doing some physiotherapy, and if there's no pain when the bone heals, I don't need the surgery. But I didn't find out about this until today. I was fully expecting to go into surgery when I originally recorded this video, hence I've now patched in this update. But the fact remains, at the time Vangelina Scal plagiarized me, I was getting ready to have surgery, meaning she added to said stress. It's safe to look back now. All of this has been a problem for my work since all of my various appointments, first for my teeth, then for my foot, have been in the middle of the day. Delhi is a mega city and is as noisy as fuck. I usually can't record during the day at the best of times, but to make things even worse, there are two apartments across the street which are being demolished one after the other. So I have to wait till midnight in order to get clean audio, meaning I have to flip my sleep cycle, meaning I can't really do that when I have so many appointments. It's not that I don't want to work, I have written six whole scripts, eight if we include this one and the follow-up that will be coming out, all backdated so far as the patrons called out towards the end, just waiting until I can record. This is something I didn't think to include in my original script, only hastily doing so now. If you can't tell, I couldn't record the entire video last night, hence the change in shirt. I woke up in the middle of the night and spent four hours trying to get the video done, about a third longer than I usually would for the number of pages being recorded. By the point I made it to the final chapter, my speech was starting to slur. I really don't think I realised just how exhausted everything the last couple of months has actually made me, so I just wanted to note that here as an additional thing that's making it difficult to work. Yet, all this isn't even the half of it, but you see, our household has been in the red since September of 2023. Adidas Field has been left in ruin by new restrictions placed on the UN by the Indian government, and I lost a number of patrons. Though, just a quick side note, I'm not angry or anything about the patrons. Please don't feel bad if you are one of them. The unifying narrative is that people's finances have been hit hard by the shit show that is literally everything happening right now. Point is, things have reached a point where, after paying for rent and utilities on a one bedroom apartment, I've had to go to my dad and ask for £100 a month just to put food on the table which I understand is a privilege in that I can do that, but it is still nerve-wracking to go from being an independent adult to someone relying on their parents' financial support. This is not a place I want to be in, and yes, it's something that keeps me up at night, staring at the ceiling as I beat myself up for not gaining enough ground. Now, if you're one of my subscribers, you might be wondering why I haven't said anything, why I haven't mentioned how dire things are, as I've done in the past. Well, mostly it's because I'd already begun my big series about the events in 2019, a series that, whilst essential for my mental health, put me in a situation where I felt like I couldn't push my Patreon more than usual, because my abusers love to assert that I'm only talking about the violence they inflicted upon me for financial gain. I had thought about putting the series off for a bit, as the first video wasn't ready to go out until mid-September, but I'd begun working on the series afresh as early as April, which can be seen in how I asked for support to get my camcorder fixed, something I felt was needed to help humanise me to the people who'd been taught that I was subhuman. I had originally planned for a July release and was feeling pretty excited towards the end of June, yet that got pushed back to August and then September. By this point, it felt like it was slipping between my fingers again. So I decided I could not put it off any longer. I needed to get all the evidence out there for people to see. So I went ahead with the series, feeling as if I had to keep everything quiet for now. I hoped to have the videos done by November, yet that clearly fell through. This is why I was so desperate to get the fifth and final video done, so that I could wait a couple of weeks and then let you know about the financial situation. So for my teeth and foot to put me out of action was downright torturous. 
Though, as you can tell, I no longer give a shit. A big reason as to why I no longer give a shit is that I found out that someone with 100,000 subscribers has just plagiarised one of the hardest series I've ever produced, mincing it up and presenting said sick mockery as their own original work. Someone who is not only making bank on the ad revenue and Patreon, but also merchandise and brand sponsorships. It's more than a little soul crushing, I'm not gonna lie. And yeah, the more I think about it, how I was ripped off, how Glay was dehumanised, and just what a lazy ass job Scout did with all that she stole, the angrier I get. And that's before we even consider how I gave Scal multiple chances to fix things, yet she decided to try and pull a fast and sneaky one before playing the lawyer card, clearly hoping that I disappear. Well, I'm not. I'm here, and I'm ready to be heard. Drawing inspiration from Tay Pratchett's Going Postal for a second, Scow, if you're watching this, I'd like you to hear what I have to say to you personally. You may not have thought to, but in a hundred small ways, you have snatched the bread from my starving mouth, pilfering our work to create a monstrosity, something that is antithetical to everything we are building towards the essence of thought. Yet, even worse than that, when I reached out to you about the harm your actions were doing to try and reach an accord, you spurned me. You pretended to ignore my cries whilst editing the description of your video, acting like you were an honourable person. When I did not give up, you threatened me. So, I have to ask you, Vangelina Scow, how does it feel to be faced by one of the people you have exploited for your own ill-gotten gain? Do you feel pride in what you have done? Achievement? Or do you just feel powerful, like you're owed everything you steal? We are beyond making amends at this point. I gave you that chance twice. I will make sure your reputation burns upon fires fueled by your own history. Because if there's one thing I've learned about plagiarists, it's that they're never satisfied with doing it once. That all it takes is for one person to stand up to go, hang on a second, and the next thing you know, you have a chain reaction of fellow victims doing the same. I hope you enjoyed your series on Illuminati's downfall, because that is where you are headed. I hope it was worth it. As for the rest of you, what do you think? How do you feel about the evidence provided throughout this video? What are your thoughts about the way I approached Scout in my emails? What do you think about the way she responded? Did you notice something I missed? If so, be sure to let me know in the comments down below. And if you appreciate what we do here and want to help out, please consider becoming one of our wonderful patrons who make our work possible. On that note, we'd just like to thank the following people. Matthew Kovac, Hannah Banghart, Garrett Van Voorst, Marble Wings, Slosh Daniels, Flynn, and Higgins the Seagull. And for myself, Adita and Levi, take care now.